be here. Before I begin, I, I just want to mention briefly uh, the new Journal of Orthodox Theology, Analogia. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but some may not be. It's published by the Pemtusia Institute in Greece. They've been running a series of special issues on Gregory Palamas. So if you're interested in Palamas, I'd recommend that. And uh, the paper I'm to give here will be in the next issue. All right. It has long been observed that Gregory Palamas seems to have deliberately refrained from describing the essence energy's distinction as conceptual or catapinian. On the other hand, his immediate followers, such as Patriarch Philopios Kokonos and the former Emperor John Cantacuzinos, described it this way freely. Some have seen this change as the beginning of a tendency among Palamas's followers to minimize the distinction in a way that brings it more into line with Thomistic thought. And I'm thinking here of people like uh, Martin Jouji and more recently uh, John Demetrikopoulos. My purpose in this paper will be to see what light can be shed on this question by a close look at the history and meaning of the distinction catapinian. Broadly speaking, eponia includes the faculty, the act, and the resulting conception formed by the process of reflecting on the deliverances of sense perception. Since this process can include taking things perceived and recombining them so as to produce fictions, some of its products are merely imaginary. More interestingly, for our purposes, its deliverances also include different ways of conceptualizing or describing a given object. Origen, for example, describes the different titles of Christ, such as light of men and shepherd, as epinion. Epinoia first became a topic of discussion in its own right during the Eunomian debate. St. Basil initially describes it in a way that emphasizes the role of the mind in dividing what otherwise appears simple. Quote, whatever seems simple and singular upon a general, uh, a general survey by the mind, but which appears complex and plural upon detailed scrutiny and thereby is divided by the mind, this sort of thing is said to be divided in thought, that is, epinoia alone. Although he notes that imaginary constructions are said to be produced by opinion, plainly his focus is on its role in discerning what is in some sense truly present in the object. Besides imaginary objects, his other examples are the analysis of the body into its constituent qualities, color, shape, solidity, size, and so on, and the many ways of naming grain, such as fruit, seed, and nourishment. Both, he says, are the result of, quote, more subtle and precise reflection upon a concept that first arises from sense perception. Terms used of God, such as unbegotten and un incorruptible, are likewise formed by considering through opinia different aspects of the divine life. Two passages of Basil were particularly significant for later developments. In the course of criticizing Eunomius's view that the Father is greater than I, John 14, 28, implies a temporal priority, Basil observes that there is a natural order between cause and effect, even when they are simultaneous. He describes the case of fire and its light, observing that, quote, we do not separate these things from one another by an interval, but through reasoning, love is most, we consider as prior the cause of the effect, and that the same is true in the case of the Father and the Son. Despite the absence of the term opinion, it is clear that the seed is here planted for seeing the distinction between the persons of the Trinity as cat opinion. The second passage occurs in Against Eunomius Book 4, a work commonly attributed today to Didymus the Blind or Apollinaris, but accepted by the Byzantines as by Basil. The author argues that the problematic verse, uh, Proverbs 8.22, the Lord created me, the beginning of his works, refers to, uh, quote, the form of a servant taken on by the word, whereas the parallel statement a few verses later, before all the hills he begets me, refers to the word in his divinity. He explains, quote, in all this, we do not speak of two, God alone and a man alone, for they are one, but we consider the nature of each conceptually, cat opinion. He thus offers what was to become an important precedent for applying the distinction cat opinion to the two natures of Christ, divine and human. Basil's colleague, Gregory Nazianzen, likewise sees the distinction between Christ's natures as conceptual. In the fourth theological oration, he argues that the terms used by Christ to address the Father differ with respect to Christ's two natures. God being a term Christ uses in his human nature, and Father in his nature as God the Word. He then adds, quote, an indication of this is that whenever the two natures are separated in conceptions, that is, opinious, 
from one another, the names are also distinguished, as you hear in Paul's words, uh, where Paul writes, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Gregory also, like Basil, sees the distinction among the persons of the Trinity as conceptual. In the Trinity, he says, there is one essence, one nature, one appellation, although we assign distinct names in accordance with our various opinion. By contrast, the unity of human nature is perceived only in thought, opinion, whereas human individuals are separated from one another in time, dispositions, and power. Cyril of Alexandria builds on these suggestions to affirm explicitly that the distinction among the persons is cat opinion. Interpreting the statement of Christ that, quote, I am in the Father and the Father in me, he offers as an analogy how sweetness may be said, uh, maybe the same, uh, might say the same of honey or heat of fire. In each case, the two are divisible in opinion, but one in nature and substance. Just as had Basil, Cyril makes it clear that calling the distinction conceptual does not deny that it exists in the natural order. On the contrary, the distinction is precisely that between a cause and the effect that comes forth from it. In the period after Chalcedon, the primary application of the distinction cat opinion uh, naturally shifted to Christology. A number of authors followed up on the suggestion of Gregory and Pseudo-Basil that the distinction between Christ's divine and human natures is cat opinion. It is in this context that we begin to find the contrast between a distinction that is conceptual and one that is real. Leontius of Byzantium affirms that the humanity and divinity of Christ are separated in opinia, but not in actuality and in area. Eustathius uh, Monachus does the same. Quote, we do not divide the natures in actuality, or as one might say, in reality, pragmaticos, but they are distinguished conceptually. From the contrast of the distinction cat opinion and that which is real, it is a short step to distinguishing two kinds of existence, the merely conceptual and the actual. However, the two contrasts do not map neatly onto one another, for items that are distinguished cat opinion can both exist in actuality. This is, in fact, essential to Neo-Chalcedonian Christology. Thus, Leontius of Byzantium, immediately after affirming that the humanity and divinity of Christ are separated in opinia, adds that they nonetheless exist in actuality. Leontius of Jerusalem observes, by way of reductio, that if Christ's human nature existed only in thought, that is, in opinion, he could possess that nature only in thought and not in reality, uh, prognity. The 7th and 8th century saw a further consolidation of these various applications of the distinction. <coughs> Maximus the Confessor, in the course of arguing against the origin's belief in the pre-existence of the soul, affirms that soul and body are distinguished only in opinion. As he goes on to explain, this does not exclude that the soul survives the death of the body or that each of them has its own essential principles. The example of soul and body also figures importantly in the dialectica of John Damascene, <coughs> where it is enlisted to clarify the difference between a veridical and a merely imaginative use of opinion. John identifies the latter with bare opinion. Opinion in the fuller sense is, quote, a certain thinking out and consideration by which the general concept and unanalyzed knowledge of things are unfolded and made fully clear. Man, for example, appears to be simple, but by opinion, he discovered, is discovered to be twofold, body and soul. And on the Orthodox faith, John puts this understanding into practice in several contexts. One of these is in cataloging the various kinds of statement made of Christ in scripture. The flesh of Christ and the word, he says, although really inseparable, can be distinguished by tenuous opinii. And this is done, uh, excuse me, this is what is done when scripture refers to Christ as servile and ignorant, as his flesh would be apart from its union with the word. That's all in book four of the Orthodox faith. Another such example is Christ referring to the Father as my God, where Christ himself engages in an act of opinion. These statements by the Damascene became a standard for right and wrong ways of thinking about Christ's humanity. In the Synodicon of Orthodoxy, we find several passages condemning those who misuse the distinction cat opinion in a way that wrongly separates Christ's divinity from his humanity. The first derives from a synod summoned in 1117 against Eustratios of Nicaea. 
Although Eustratius renounced the condemned views, a statement was nonetheless included in the Synodicon, anathematizing those who, quote, do not employ with all reverence the distinction cat opinion for the purpose of showing only the difference between the ineffably conjoined two natures in Christ, but employ this distinction improperly and say the humanity of Christ assumed is different not only in nature but in dignity, and that it worships God and offers a servile ministry. <clears throat> although, although the two natures can be distinguished cat opinion then, such a distinction must not be used to envision the human nature is capable of acting independently, or to conjecture what it would be like if it were to exist alone. In 1170, following further controversy, a clause was added to the profession of faith required of candidate bishops before their ordination, affirming that Christ's human nature, quote, is in no way to be considered naked and separated from the divinity by a subtle uh, catopinian division, but is always to be in to be seen subsisting with the Logos in a single hypostasis. The controversy over the Filioque brought a similar attention to the question of conceptual distinction in the Trinity. The so-called Synodicon against John Beckos, issued in 1285, includes a condemnation against those who attempted to draw support for the Filioque from a statement of Gregor of Nyssa to the effect that the Son is prior cat opinion to the Spirit. The document explains that the Son is regarded as prior cat opinion on account of the nomenclature of the relationships which lead to divine knowledge of the person of the spirit. <clears throat> In other words, the role of the conceptual distinction here is, is purely epistemic and does not indicate a priority in the causal order. Nonetheless, it remained commonplace to refer to the persons of the Trinity as distinguished conceptually in accordance with long established precedent. So in the 14th century, we find something of a mixed scorecard continuing use of the terminology of opinion, but in at least some quarters, confusion or hesitation regarding its meaning. Let us now turn to the application of this distinction to that between essence and energies. As mentioned earlier, Palamas seems to have deliberately refrained from describing the essence energies distinction as cat opinion. In light of the history we have observed, this should be no surprise. The range of items traditionally described as distinct cat opinion is immense. It includes the names of Christ, the divine attributes, the persons of the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, the flesh of Christ and the word, and the human body and soul. Plainly, this is an extremely heterogeneous group, and much that is true in any one case does not carry over to the others. The persons of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, for example, exist as distinct in full actuality prior to any act of human thought whereas the same cannot be said, at least according to Maximus, of the body and soul. On the other hand, the body and soul can, after their initial union, exist apart from one another, whereas the same is not true of the divine persons or the two natures. Because of this heterogeneity, to describe a distinction as cat opinion can invite considerable confusion, as occurred in regard to the two natures of Christ and, to a lesser extent, the persons of the Trinity. What all this shows is, is that to speak, of, to speak of two things as distinct cat opinion is taken alone not an ontological statement at all. It is an epistemological statement in that it identifies the means by which we conceive or recognize the two things as distinct. That is through reflection rather than sense experience. As we saw earlier, this has been the basic meaning of the term ever since antiquity. Confusion enters because the term opinion is also used in statements that do have ontological significance, as when something is said to be conceived by bare opinia, meaning in the imagination, or to exist in opinia and not in reality. Careful attention must be paid to the specific locution and context to discern the meaning in each case. Taking the term in its epistemological sense, it is certainly true that the essence energy's distinction is cat opinion, since both concepts involved are formed through reflection. But to say this is not very helpful as regards the ontological issues that are generally of interest. Furthermore, it can invite confusion by seeming to suggest that we can intelligibly ask what the essence would be like apart from the energies, or vice versa. As Palamas never tires of reiterating, no essence can exist without its natural energies, nor can an energy exist without being the active manifestation of some essence. 
I would suggest that it was primarily to avoid such potential confusions that Palamas quietly eschewed referring to opinion. His immediate followers, such as Coconus and Cantacuzinus, were less cautious. No doubt they wished for polemical reasons to emphasize as clearly as they could the limited character of the distinction. This seems a sufficient explanation in the case of Coconus, who wrote prior to the appearance of the Greek translations of Aquinas. The case of Cantacuzinus is more complex, since he may have intended his usage of opinia to be understood in light of that given to it in these translations. On the basis of evidence so far presented, however, I'm not yet convinced that there is truly a substantive difference between him and his predecessors, and I, I disagree there with uh, Demetrikopoulos. More work will be needed to determine precisely the effect of the Thomistic translations on the unfolding of Polynism. The best general description of the essence energy distinction remains that which is implied by the meaning of the word energia itself. It is the distinction between an agent and that agent's activity. As I have pointed out elsewhere, in the case of God, we must recognize that the range of his energiae is extremely diverse. Some are eternal and others temporal. Some are contingent and others necessary. Some are best conceived as realities or energies, others as activities or operations, and yet others as attributes. There is no simple label that will describe the ontological distinction among these various forms of energy, or between the energies and the essence, even though from an epistemological point of view, they are all distinct cat opinion. Thank you. Thank you. We, we could take one or two questions just now. Yes, sir. Um, you know, a century later, Solaris makes the distinction into a privacy. And I, I think that's a metaphysical claim rather than epistemological. Do you think that adds anything? Does it add anything? Well, Scolarius tries very hard to be faithful to Palamas. You know, he's constantly citing Palamas. Uh, in fact, if I could uh, just briefly re refer back to Analogia, uh, the current issue has an article by George Capri, you know, the uh, Bulgarian historian of philosophy, that's all about Scolarius' interpretation of the essence energy's distinction and how faithful it is to Palamas. Uh, it is true that Scolarius introduces some new terminology because he's writing for an audience educated in Latin scholasticism. But I think his use of pragmati is, um, you know, is not exactly equivalent to, say, the scholastic real distinction. I think you have to look carefully at how he explains it. Thank you. Uh, yes? Do you have a microphone, please? No. The microphone, if no, it's available. But matter. go ahead, I think. Uh, I'm not very sure that I understood very well if you proposed um, Catepinian versus pragmati. Um, if, if we are thinking that Catepinia is only an intellectual um, process, process uh, we have a problem with that um, Catepinian is not uh, in the sense of imagination. Um, everything that is Catepinia must be in, in pragmaticotita, in pragmati, in reality. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very close to, and I, I I'm very close and I, I agree with the Father Sufron Saharov point of view that um, in the Holy Trinity we have to, we have to speak about uh, simultaneous distinction and identity. Mm -hmm. So we have a distinction be, be, be between energies and, uh, and essence and we have an identity between both of them, but this is sim simultaneous. Because yeah. if we act, we, we we have a tone on catepinia, we lose the pragmati. If we have an accent on pragmati, we lose the catepinia. Okay. Must to be both and in the same time distinction. distinction. <coughs> and this is the antinomy of Gregorius Palama. Well, I think that's right. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, when the uh, Neo-Chalcedonians are talking about the two natures of Christ, they, they say they're distinguished catepinian, but they exist pragmati, right? So I think we see there the difference between uh, the epistemological distinction. When they say they're distinguished cat opinion, they mean that's the process of thought by which we come to recognize them as distinct. But when they, they say they exist pragmati, uh, they both exist in full actuality. And the same would be true of the persons of the Trinity. 
And I think that would roughly parallel uh, the essence energies distinction. Um, so uh, I don't see any conflict there. But again, we have, to, you know, there's a third use of the term when people talk about bare opinion or existing in bare opinion. That's imagination, right? So we have to keep that clearly distinct. Maybe just one more. 